Thank you so much, and it is a privilege and a pleasure to be here this morning. And um, Kelly, I have loved working with you as well because you are truly a national leader um, in, in pub public policy. So um, what I want to talk to you about today is uh, a couple of thoughts on uh, dovetailing off of your comments as well as the Digital Learning Council and some recommendations for policy changes within the state. To give you an overview, um, I am President and CEO of a, a nonprofit called Integrated Educational Strategies and we work on a national level currently working with multiple different states in doing three items, policy and advocacy review and redesign, instructional redesign with an emphasis in blended and digital learning, and then parent advocacy and support strategies. This has given us a, a viewpoint that is really amazing because as we get into these different states and we work with their departments of ed and we work with the different school districts, we see similarities and we th see things that are, that are different. And so we brought that back and I've taken that knowledge today and thought, okay, how can we look at what California is doing, Arizona is doing, New Mexico, uh, all these other states, and apply them to ways that we can grow here in, um, in Georgia. So in Georgia alone, uh, there are 1,522,611 students enrolled in grades K-12. to the Fordham Institute just did a study. They said if you, um, and I've got all of that information here, so I brought extra copies if you'd like to have this afterwards, please come see me. Um, but if you implement a digital or blended learning program, the cost savings can be up to 15% because of savings due to technology. So in Georgia, the uh, average per pupil expenditure is $8,595 per student. So with the uh, estimated that with the proper implementation of blended learning, the cost savings can amount to $1,289 per student or $1.98 billion in the state. Last year, as you know, as you mentioned, we do have a dropout epidemic in the United States. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone in this room is aware, but our, uh, our national average for graduation is between 65 and 67 percent. That means over 30 percent of our kids in our nation's schools that go into high school do not graduate. And if you extrapolate that out to the economic impact on our nation and our individual states, it, it, is, it is considered a crisis. Today alone, while we are in our jobs and doing what we're doing, 6,000 kids will drop out of school across the United States. 6,000. And then you have to ask yourself, why is that? What's happening? Their study came out and said that 88% of those kids were actually academically succeeding at the time that they dropped out. So our first reaction is, oh, well, they were failing. Actually, they were bored. Now, bored and disengaged was the number one reason for dropout. Second the reason was life got in the way. So I had to go to work, or I got pregnant, or whatever the issues are of kids in high school. We have an ability to solve the first issue, the disengagement. We, as we look around at our kids, we're seeing that they are engaged in a digital world on a daily basis. This weekend, I had the privilege of actually going to a restaurant and watching the playoff games. It was so fun with a whole group of people that were cheering. It was really great. But what caught my attention was this particular restaurant. When I was a kid, you'd go in and they'd give you crayons and a piece of paper. They gave these kids iPads. And so the kids were sitting at the tables with the iPads. And I, I looked over at the table next to me, and there was a four-year-old on the iPad. and said, Mommy, Mommy, look at this. And the mom was going, show me about that. Tell me about that. And I thought, this is their world. And yet, this is, our, this is our native language, and in most of our schools, we ask them to stop speaking their native language the minute they get into the classroom door. <laughs> so how does that make sense? Kids are walking around with mobile technology in their pockets. Every single student at the high school level has a cell phone, probably. A lot of them are smart, smartphones. So what, why are we telling kids that they can't use that? Why are we prohibiting kids from social media in the classroom? And allowing some of because we're we're concerned we're concerned about um, we're concerned about privacy we're concerned about security those are great areas to be concerned in but 95 percent of our kids would probably be responsible so why are we prohibiting them from using it to save the five percent that aren't mm -hmm. so that's where smart policy and redesign comes in last year in Georgia 44,884 students dropped out of high school. It's estimated that in Georgia, if Georgia graduated just 1,000 more of these 44,884 students, combined, the new graduates would likely, one, earn $11 million in additional earnings in an average year. So that's an average income of $11,000 per graduate. 
spend an additional $1.1 million each year purchasing vehicles, and by the time they reach the midpoint of their careers, the buy homes are worth $24 million more than they would have if they'd spent life without a diploma. And lastly, they would support 120 new jobs in the state, increase the gross state product by $16 million, and pour an additional $800,000 annually into the state coffers, all for their increased spending and investments. That's just if 1,000 kids could graduate. So when we're looking at all of this, we're looking at what is the solution. It seems obvious that the solution is digital learning. Is it a solution of blended and learning and integrating that into our classroom? So as Kelly mentioned, in 2010, Governor Wise and Governor Bush put together an initial initiative called the Digital Learning Council. I had the privilege of directing that uh, initiative, and we had 100, group, 100 people from uh, leaders in education, government, philanthropy, business, technology, and members of policy think tanks. They all came together. It was an intensive process. We met over 72 times, and the end result was a, a report called Digital Learning Now that was released in December of 2010 in Washington, D.C. So your own Senator Chip Rogers was actually a leader in that, so I just want to give a shout out to you. Um, for he attended every meeting he contributed and I, I, could, I knew I could always depend upon him to, to bring valuable information so thank you again for all of your participation and hard work on, on that. <laughs> what the group um, designed was the 10 elements of digital learning and is organized in three general areas customization and success for all students a robust offering of high school high quality options and infrastructure it was amazing the type of perspectives that were brought into these discussions and how we together were crafting what the policy was moving forward. So they've taken it to the next level. Now that we've got the report, there's an initiative called the Digital Learning Now Initiative. This is a national campaign to integrate current and future technological innovations in public education to better prepare students with knowledge and skills that they need to succeed. From that initiative, we've now got something called the Roadmap to Reform. The Roadmap to Reform provides governors, lawmakers, and policymakers with tangible steps to transforming education into a model for a world, a system where every student graduates from high school with the skills and knowledge to succeed in college and career. These are all facts and figures that can be found at the Alliance for Excellent Education and the Foundation for Excellence in Education. And I can give you both of those websites uh, if you're interested. INACAL is a, a national group I, I have the privilege of currently serving as the chair of the Advocacy and Issues Committee for our day call. So I've got 75 folks on my committee that represent state agencies, that represent uh, politicians, that represent everybody down to the district level. We meet on a monthly basis and we look at the policy issues in, in across our nation as it relates to digital and blended learning. We did a survey last month and we asked our members, uh, do, are you familiar with what's going on in Georgia? And if you are, can you please tell us uh, what, are, what would be your top three recommendations if we needed to make policy change? The number one recommendation that came back was change from seat time to competency-based education. So exactly that verifies. Um, our survey verifies your findings as well. Eliminate geographic boundaries. Allow students from any area to enroll in a new school and have choice. Uh, teacher certifications. Move to the, we are moving to the Common Core Standards. And so there should also be a national certification that goes along with that. Currently in Georgia, there's 340 high schools, and there are 70 highly qualified NCLB, highly qualified physics teachers. That means that almost 75% of the students in Georgia do not have access to a highly qualified teacher at their school site. A way that, something that could solve that is digital learning. If we could have a Georgia qualified, high, highly qualified physics teacher actually doing online instruction and a blended digital model, we could open that up to all of the students in the state. But there are barriers that are currently uh, prohibiting that from happening. We could also open up uh, other teachers. I, uh, prior to moving to Atlanta, I spent 25 years in the public education system uh, in California. So I worked um, not only as a site administrative assistant superintendent, but worked at the Department of Ed there as a consultant. And uh, one of the things that we were able to do is we actually started an online uh, high school in the Los Angeles area for at-risk kids, kids who are, uh, who are at risk of dropping out. 70, over 70% 70 of our kids that enrolled in that school were already dropped out. We were amazed at the response. These are kids that wanted an option, but life got in the way. 
But because um, we were doing it online, I was able to hire, like my French teacher was actually a professor at UCLA. So now these kids who were at a at risk of dropping out in their traditional high schools at their site-based locations now had access to learn from a professor at UCLA all free of cost to them. We need to provide that to students everywhere. Get the high, highest quality instructors to students without the barriers of geographic restrictions. I'm going to talk about the three elements that I thought we should call out really quickly about from the Digital Learning Now report. Um, the, the Roadmap to Reform actually published a report card for every state, and this was just issued. This is a report card for Georgia. It takes all these 10 elements and it rates it in 72 different uh, categories. Uh, so I can uh, show you how to get access to that as well. It's very interesting. But the one thing I want to encourage you with is that Georgia is actually one of the forefront runners in education. People uh, for the last several years have looked at all of the things that we've done right in this state and are looking at it as a model. We constantly look to Georgia and say, look what they're doing here, look what Georgia's doing here, look what Georgia's doing there. So I want to encourage you that on a statewide basis, you've, Georgia has done a lot of things well. Uh, the three things that I want to talk about briefly was um, element number nine was funding. So of course this drew the most uh, conversation in our, in our meetings. Uh, how are we going to fund this? What does it mean I if they're not site-based or can it be funded on a course-by-course -course basis? What if a student wants to go to school part-time and take online part-time? How do we fund that? What does that look like? And what are the funding levels uh, that, that, are at, that are correct for online learning? So the recommendations of the committee was to create a self-sustaining funding system. So in other words, erase, erase the terms for funding. It should be year-round and it should be based upon students going in and out of school. So if you open up the school calendar and don't make it to a semester basis, when students get in, they matriculate, they move on when ready, then in six, eight weeks, they can graduate from that course and that provider will be paid for that course. One other note on the move on when ready, um, three weeks ago I was working in Arizona and there's a high school, they've started the uh, Center for Arizona's Future is actually on Arizona State University and it's an initiative led strongly by Senator Rich Crandall who's the head of the education committee in the state. They've implemented move on when ready this year in several pilot sites across the state. So they have seen a lot of um, uh, success in that and I just mentioned that because if when we move to do that here, other states are already a little bit ahead and we can learn uh, from them best practices. Follow, the funding follows the student and there is flexibility with textbook dollars. So the policy suggestions would be that the state law permits funding for instructional materials to be used to purchase digital content and systems. That's currently um, allowed. A state allows for digital content to be acquired through instructional materials budgets and does not discourage digital content with print adoption practices and the state funding model pays providers in installments and incentivize completion and achievement. So that was a, that was a real controversial uh, point, but other states are seeing that they're paying not on seat time, but a portion when the student enrolls, a portion throughout the middle, and then a portion if they actually successfully complete the course. Uh, and the other, uh, the last recommendation is state does not limit the number of credits earned online. Currently, Georgia limits students to one course uh, per semester and allows for a uh, uh, allows for choice. The second thing, both in our, uh, in our elements and in our survey, was uh, there was a huge desire here to have a K-12 learning object repository. There's currently a bill uh, that's in, uh, sponsored by uh, Representative Cassis and Senator Rogers, uh, HB 175. It's called the Online Clearinghouse Act, and it would actually create this initiative. So according, in talking to, um, re, uh, to educators in the state, their thoughts was if we, could, if we can create this um, clearinghouse, we wouldn't have to recreate the wheel. So let's um, have a clearinghouse where, sorry my slides are, shared by all Georgia local school districts and is in a format that can be used with their learning management system. We need an interagency approach. University, state agencies, and school districts need to stop being in silos and work together to create this aligned to the common course standards and could develop protocols that would cover formatting, consistency of the environment, and standards for multimedia with an opportunity for national expansion. The next is uh, make high quality digital learning resources. Don't just give us PDF files of textbooks. 
don't do what we've always done, but put it online. That is a big weakness right now of a lot of the programs. They get, they, they just layer technology onto the instructional practices, but they don't redesign it for success. We need to push the envelope. We need to have more electronic gaming, 3D virtual world simulations and transmedia, and then offer differentiation of instruction. Assessment and account accountability and infrastructure. So the last policy recommendation is the state law requires a majority of content, such as textbooks, to, to be provided digitally. State law requires all schools to have high-speed broadband internet access. State law requires all teachers to be provided with internet access devices. And the state law requires that all students to have internet access devices. And the last one is to eliminate the seat time requirements, which we've already talked about. So um, I would encourage you, uh, this is a really great read if you're interested in how Georgia did in 72 different elements. It's found on the Foundation for Excellence Education website, um, and it's uh, very illuminated. As well, uh, I do have this that talks about the funding structures, the Fordham Institute, and other opportunities that we have in Georgia. So thank you so much for your time, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody afterwards.